sightings. In the 1950s, was the USS Franklin Delano Roosevelt the object of extraterrestrial observation? It looked like a star, but was much brighter, so it disappeared into the moonlight. Then, a sightings exclusive. Our Heartland Ghost Investigation continues. A family is forced from their home by a violent spirit. Something's going on in that house. It's strange activity. Plus, a psychic leads twin sisters to the family they never knew. The minute she came to the motel where we were staying and walked in the door, it was just as if we'd always known her. And a terrifying past life memory forces this woman to relive the horrors of the Holocaust. I kept having this image of being in this other woman's body that I just lost my mind. Later, are extraterrestrials time travelers from our own future? Extraterrestrials manipulate the fabric of space and time. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. In 1952, military personnel stood together on the deck of a Navy flagship, the USS FDR, and watched as a disc-shaped UFO hovered above them. Three photographs were taken, and this sighting was just the first of many reported aboard the ship. Despite vehement denials from the Navy, many people who served on the USS FDR believe that she was a UFO magnet. Sometime in late July, early August of 1952, as an ensign, I saw a bright light at the forward of the bow on the right-hand side, which would be the starboard side. The ship was on a shakedown cruise near Gitmo, Cuba. And I was down below decks. It was maybe approximately 8, 9 o'clock in the evening, I think it was. And this buddy of mine, uh, Vince, who's seen a bunch of uh, men coming from the engine room compartment running up topside on a ladder, said, Red, why don't you go up there and see what's going on? So I follow these guys up uh, three or four decks up to the flight deck, and we're watching this little object, like a light, that, were, that was following our ship. And then it came out of the sky at us. My friends called me to come outside, and we observed a bright light quite high in the sky. Uh, it looked like a star, but was much brighter. The light tracked at a high speed and came to a stop, altered direction, and accelerated to a high speed, stopped again, and it proceeded across the sky in this manner until it disappeared into the moonlight. These three men, Robert Coburn, Chester Grzynski, and John Lawrence, all served on the USS FDR. But each man was assigned to the ship on different tours, in different years, and with different jobs. And yet each man saw the same thing sometime during his service, an unidentified flying object tracking the Navy aircraft carrier through the sky. Others stood with them and witnessed the same events, which occurred over a 10-year period. But there is no record of any sightings in the ship's logs, and attempts to find other eyewitnesses have failed. I know that during September of 52, there were a series of incidents during Operation Main Brace, which was a series of naval maneuvers, military maneuvers with other countries. And during those maneuvers, there were a number of UFO incidents reported, one occurring uh, in connection with a fighter jet, which had been followed by an unidentified flying object. Barry Greenwood is the research director of CAUSE, Citizens Against UFO Secrecy. He is also the co-author of the UFO cover-up, Greenwood has collected photographs of UFOs taken in 1952 from the deck of the flagship for Operation Mainbrace. They were taken aboard the USS Franklin D. Roosevelt. On September 20th, a newspaper reporter was on the flight deck of the carrier and a color camera with him. And he said he turned down the flight deck and noticed a group of guys looking up into the sky. He ran down there and noticed a large spherical object hanging in the air. Everybody was looking at it, so he had his camera. He decided to take some shots. And when he ran the exposures, he said the object accelerated, took off at high speed, disappeared. They thought it was a balloon initially. So the brass called the various other ships in the area, asked about a balloon. Nobody launched a balloon. 
Nobody knows anything about it. They listed it as an unknown. Possible balloon, but nobody knows where it came from. No, it's quite obvious that we had seen something. We don't know what it was. We knew that it couldn't be an airplane because an airplane could not start and stop. The rate of speed was too high, too fast for a helicopter, and it was too erratic a pattern uh, track for a weather balloon. Leon Treadwell also served on the USS FDR in the 1950s. He recalls a UFO encounter he witnessed, along with several other men, while on anchor watch in Rio de Janeiro. Two ships, or appeared to be ships, one above the other, maybe about two or three hundred feet separated but the two of them, and the counter-rotating lights. And uh, all of a sudden, a fireball dropped between the upper ship to the lower ship. Nobody knew what the devil was going on. There was actual radar contact on these uh, vehicles. This painting depicts what Leon claims he and several other sailors saw on board the USS FDR that night. Several officers in, and uh, these, these are representatives of divisional departments. They couldn't believe what they were looking at. Everybody signed a release statement that nobody outside of CIC would say anything about this uh, for at least 15 to 20 years. The CIC, the Combat Information Center, is master control for any Navy aircraft carrier. Here is where radar, mapping, target searches, and operations are conducted. We were just told to, to not say anything about this to anybody outside of, of uh, Combat Information Center. The commander down in Virginia, when I was discussing this with him, he was on a ship, he told me that I wasn't even supposed to mention this. I just ignored what he said. It's one of my desires in life is to find these other witnesses that were up on that flight deck with me witnessing this object as it came on top of the ship. A lot of times I wish that this would have never happened because uh, all the aggravation has caused me. I had people that uh, laughed and said they wouldn't believe me. And really? Yeah, I was there. I was there. I seen it. You weren't there. You don't know. You don't know what it was like. But why would an unidentified flying object of this Earth or any other spend nearly a decade tailing this particular ship? Crewman claimed that the FDR carried advanced nuclear weaponry that was supposedly top secret. The sighting was well known to insiders in the government at the time. It was written about by the head of Project Blue Book after he retired from the military. And uh, he described it in great detail. It's a possibility that uh, our weapons were of, uh, of uh, a sort that they were interested in. Uh, of course, a carrier ca carried all kinds of different weapons. The FDR uh, was the only aircraft carrier at the time that had uh, thermal and nuclear capability. It was the only one uh, that was allowed to uh, carry the H-bomb. We would be the only ship, naturally, that would carry them because we would be, have the only method of delivering the, the uh, atomic bombs. Since World War II, there have been a number of UFO sightings linked to nuclear storage and transport facilities. But these reports remain unsubstantiated, in large part because the government organization best equipped to investigate the sightings, the U.S. military, refuses to do so. I think they are probably covering up the incidents with the FDR because they're covering up all incidences of UFO sightings. I won't uh, rest till I find somebody else that was on that flight deck uh, with me and witnessed that same thing I did. The experience of the crew members aboard the USS FDR may not be unique. Sightings is currently conducting an in-depth investigation into charges that UFO confrontations have occurred at three different military bases where nuclear weapons are stored. We'll bring you the results of that investigation on a future edition of Sightings. Next, a Sightings exclusive. A violent spirit continues its assault on a Midwestern family. It happened so quick. I'm sitting right here and I didn't see it. It's on my side. This is what we know so far. A two-story house built in 1872 sits on a tree-lined street in the Midwest. Inside, many people, including members of our sightings investigative team, have reported feeling anomalous cold spots, eerie contacts with amorphous entities, and inexplicable electrical energy. 
One man has been plagued by spontaneous bleeding welts that he attributes to a vindictive spirit. What we don't know is why. What is causing this haunting activity in America's heartland? I could feel it. How did that happen? You don't know. I, I, uh, yeah. Sally? I want to walk in there. I'm walking there. Oh, my God. Look. Look. It's forming right there. I have two scratches. Oh, look there it is. Him. Look at it. It'd be OK if I sit down first. Why don't you sit, why don't you sit down, Sally? Sightings viewers have their own theories. The wounds are self-inflicted, an allergic reaction, or psychosomatically induced. The victim, his family, and many visitors here believe the strange phenomena are caused by a vindictive entity in the house. And that is why this family has moved out. But the empty house is still the focus of an ongoing sightings investigation. World-renowned paranormal investigator Kerry Gaynor believes this case deserves the same careful attention he brought to two previous cases, the entity and poltergeist cases. With the family gone, Gaynor has a unique opportunity to determine if the source of the ghostly activity is the site or the family. Maury Schrag is an environmental engineer with the Industrial Compliance and Safety Corporation. He was brought in to search for electromagnetic anomalies, temperature shifts, between 25 and 30, abnormal radiation levels, or unusual levels of radon, carbon monoxide, or other gases. Nothing unusual was picked up, but there were still reports of ghostly activity by many visitors to the home, including the owner, a 20-year veteran of the local police department. My hand got real cold. I mean, it got real cold. I thought somebody was doing something. I looked back both ways, and I asked everybody in the room if they had felt that. I said, it startled me. It kind of scared me. Did you all feel that? And uh, I didn't buy any of this. I really didn't until that happened. It happened. And, uh, we had felt the room temperature drop out, which I figured was a draft in the room. But when it touched me, that was not a draft. Something's going on in that house. It's strange activity. What it is, I don't know. And so far, scientific equipment has failed to come up with the answer. We thought we might find something. As we took several different kinds of measurements, and we found basically that the readings were no significant deviations. The lack of scientific evidence in the face of so many personal experiences convinced the family to seek help of another kind. They asked that an exorcism be performed to rid them of the entity. We were all holding hands, and at one point, my husband would grip real, real hard. We were told not to let go, don't break the circle. And he just held on real tight because he was in such pain. Um, it was odd because he's never really felt the pain before. But afterwards, we found out that he had been s swiped at with, with a hand across his back on three separate occasions that left, I think it was 11 scratches right across the center, upper portion of his back, his shoulder area. These are the scratches that materialized during that exorcism. And as long as the family stayed away from the house, the scratches didn't return. But during our investigation and an online computer forum with sightings viewers, the family dropped in unexpectedly and within minutes, so did Sally. Whoa. So did you feel it here or down here? Where did you feel? Kind of like all across here. Oh, the whole face? Yeah. First, a scratch appeared on his face. Then, moments later, deeper cuts appeared on his back. You physically felt that? Yeah, that hurt. Describe to me again what you, what you felt. This sharp thing felt like somebody stabbing something to my back. Okay? Yeah. Still hurt? No. We set up additional cameras and monitoring equipment, hoping to capture any further scratching episodes. It was while we were setting up that the victim, who had always wished to remain anonymous, told us he wanted to reveal his true identity. Sightings has made a habit of coming back uh, to visit you. Mm -hmm. um, during that time, you asked them to disguise your appearance. Now you're finally allowing them to uh, use your appearance. Uh, what changed for you? Well, it, it's something that me and my wife had. We talked about a lot. And it's a pretty religious town. And I didn't know what kind of feedback we'd get from this type of situation. The more we've talked about it, 
And since we, we have been on television a few times, and we've been getting some pretty positive feedback. I mean, the people have accepted it really well. So people aren't ridiculing you as much no, like I you mean, thought they might. We, we get our taunts every once in a while, mm -hmm. or somebody will, you know, say something. But it's something that you just, I know what's happening, mm -hmm. and my wife knows what's happening, and that's what's important to me. Now, here's a new one right now. Right now. Right here. Brand new. Can anyone get closer? Yeah, we're pretty close. I'm sitting right here, and I didn't it's see on your side, yeah. It's on my side. I'm sitting right next to you. Mm -hmm. This scratch right here, all the way down to here, was not on your face when we came in because we saw this one here. We examined your face, your stomach, your back. Your hands are right here in full view of the camera and in full view of all of us. If one of those hands had gone to your face, I would have seen it. It would have been on that camera. This is truly incredible. <laughs> truly incredible. This happened. Right here, right, right this moment. Mm -hmm. If this were true, typical poltergeist phenomena, it would follow Tony to his new home. Now, he's only been in his new home a month, so it's still a little bit too early to make that kind of judgment yet. The story's not complete here. We've got a lot more work to do. Sightings will continue to investigate this groundbreaking case. New tenants are set to move into the house. We'll monitor their experiences and also follow Pam and Jeff into their new home to determine if it is the house or the people who are the focus of this haunting. Coming up next, a psychic reunites twin sisters with their lost family. It was just as if we'd always known her. There was no strangeness. We just felt she was our sister. Since they were born, Alice Heck and Agnes Nash have shared a special, some would say, psychic bond. Their lives have followed parallel paths. They finish each other's sentences. If one of them is hurt, the other feels pain. It's behavior typical of identical twins, and that's how Alice and Agnes have always explained it. But when they were 51 years old, their mother revealed that Alice and Agnes were not twins. Alice and Agnes were born in 1926. They share the same likeness, the same birthday, and a powerful mental bond. We're exact, identical mirror twins with hypertelepathy, which means it's almost like a form of psychic. I can see in my mind what she's doing. She can see in her mind what I'm doing. I can always tell you what she's wearing. She can always tell you what I'm wearing. If I go to the store to buy something, she can see in her mind what I'm buying. She'll go to the store and buy the same dang thing. When she went through labor, I went through the whole thing with her, and when I had my twins, she went through it with me. The girls grew up in Rochester, New York, and for 51 years, they believed they were identical twins, until the day their mother shared a long-hidden family secret. My mother told me when we were 51 years old, about two months before she died, she called us to her house. And she says, I've got something to tell you. I don't know how you're going to take it. And she said, I realize that I do not have too much longer to live. She knew she was very, very sick. And she said, I think you better sit down. We both more or less said, what is it? And she says, well, you've always thought you were identical twins. Well, we are. No, you're not. You have two more. You are there are four of you and she said there were four of us that she had seen the four uh, that the two were taken at birth their mother died before Alice and Agnes could find out their missing siblings names addresses or even if they were boys or girls for the next 17 years they sought help from private detectives adoption agencies and law enforcement nothing worked until they asked a psychic for help. During the reading, what I picked up most importantly was the sister's name right away. It just flowed right out of me. But also a sense of sadness that their sister would really be reluctant about meeting up with them and connecting with them. Sandra also told Alice and Agnes that they would discover the whereabouts of this missing sister on Father's Day and meet her in the summer, just one month after the psychic reading. 
during an appearance on a TV talk show, the connection was made. A little boy was watching that show and noticed a striking family resemblance. And that's when the grandson of our new sister saw us and thought we looked like his grandmother, and that's how this all started. That sister had also been looking for her birth family. She contacted Alice and Agnes on Father's Day and met them that same summer, just as the psychic had predicted. The minute she came to the motel where we were staying and walked in the door, it was just as if we'd always known her. There was no strangeness. We just felt she was our sister, and that was it. The twins were now triplets. And as they began to learn more and more about their separate lives, they discovered a number of eerie similarities, although they had grown up miles apart in different families. Some of the similarities have been that she has a son and daughter, Mark and Maureen. I have a son and daughter, Mark and Maureen. Her daughter, Maureen, was born July 12, 1952. My son, Jimmy, was born July 12, 1952. I lost twin girls back in 1960. And her one child, boy, was born the same day that I lost the twin girls, October the 3rd. There is another similarity that's a very marked one. My sister was married the year before I was the new sister. And I was, when we got married, she bought her gown in her hometown at a specialty shop. I bought my gown here in Rochester in a specialty shop. She had hers altered, and so did I, with seat pearls in the neckline. Our headpieces were almost identical. Baptismal records support Alice and Agnes's belief that this is their sister. But as the psychic predicted, the long-lost sister isn't ready to accept this new family. She is still looking for a paper trail. I guess it's overwhelmed her, according to what she says. She doesn't want her name used or anything right now. But she admits to us that she knows in her heart that she is our sister. So now we're leaving it up to her. While Alice and Agnes work on building a relationship with their sister, there is still a hole to be filled. There is yet another sibling out there somewhere, and psychic Sandra Sanfilippo believes it is a brother. I hope that we do find him. He would be 68 years old. He might look like us. He may have dark. Our hair is naturally dark. He might have gray hair because it's also gray hair in the family. Uh, he, his birthday should be April the 6th, 1926. Alice and Agnes are confident in Sandra's psychic vision. They will search until they find the brother who can complete their family portrait. Well, the most that we want to get out of this whole thing is to get the four of us together so that we can all love one another and be there for one another in thickness and in thin, no That's matter what it. the future yes. might bring. Because if they are in pain or need, we want to be, we there. be there. I want to know that they're going to be all right. Alice and Agnes continue to search for the brother that they believe is out there somewhere. It's a reunion we hope to share with you on an upcoming edition of Sightings. Next, a terrifying past life memory forces this woman to relive the horrors of the Holocaust. Then, have scientists found a link between alien visitation and time travel? And a psychic finds clues to a murder through dreams. Reincarnation is the belief that a person's essence, their soul, never dies, but is simply transferred from body to body for eternity. Some people claim that they can recall their past lives. Taylor Sammons believes she is one of those people, and there is one past life she can never forget. Why else would she have vivid memories of her own death in a Nazi concentration camp? I was sure I was, I was crazy. I was sure that the fact that I kept having this image, this memory of being in this other woman's body that I just lost my mind. She was developing some headaches, severe ones, and in going over what was happening with her currently, I wasn't able to come up with any rationale, therapeutic type rationale, that would explain these headaches. Probably the fourth session after the headaches, she showed me some welting, and I couldn't explain that either. I got tattoos. Uh, they were marks on my arm, and I and they ran all the way up, 
and they were sore, and you could literally see numbers. When the therapy began to change based on this new symptomology, I was thinking, oh my God, what is it that, that's going on here? This is, this, something is very different. I'm very puzzled, I guess I was very puzzled as to uh, where this was all coming from. And it was as if becoming me, being born in 1957, in Seattle was a joke. It had never really happened the way it was. And that feeling alone made me crazy. It was at that point we both agreed to look at some regressive work and see if there was something else going on. These were the kinds of images that overtook Taylor Sammons when she began regression therapy, the nauseating vision of one regime's attempt to decimate an entire race, and the personal horror of feeling somehow responsible. And Taylor Sammons learned that she was not alone Rabbi Ianasim Gershom has uncovered other cases of supposed Holocaust reincarnation and has come to believe that they are real. Her story is very similar to other stories that I have heard of people having these memories and often having a great deal of guilt, a great deal of pain. Through past life regression therapy, Taylor came to believe that she was once Catherine, a German Jew born in 1914 and that her death occurred in the German concentration camp known as Buchenwald. In looking at the genuineness of the memories of Catherine, I believed, and I still believe today, uh, that they were very genuine. And what would happen would be that uh, we would sit down and start the regressive process, and Taylor then would start to lose her sense of self right there, and Catherine would emerge. And Catherine would start talking about events that she was struggling with and things that have happened in her life, some very traumatic, very traumatic. And these were the kinds of things that Taylor, throughout the years of knowing her therapeutically, I don't believe she could have known at all, nor could she have prefabricated in a regressive state. Among her past life memories was the name of a town, Lunenburg, where Taylor believes Catherine once lived. It is among the remembrances she has chronicled in her therapy journal. I lived in a village before we lived in the city. To tell you the name of the city, I want to say Lunenburg. I think this is the town square where nice things went on at first. And these were like buildings. These were the tops of buildings. They were rounded, and they had something up here. I remember cobblestone roads. I remember because I've never seen them. The obscure German town of Lunenburg actually does exist. It is known for its unique architecture, beautiful cobblestone streets and marketplace. There is a fountain in the middle of the square. These uncanny coincidences led Taylor to explore her memories further with renowned past life therapist Frank Baranowski. Together, they uncovered more details of Catherine's life. She had two children and was pregnant when she was arrested. And this is the time when she feels like the children can't go to a concentration camp and she decides to take their life. My children were five and under two and then the baby was born in the camp. I killed my daughter first. I suffocated her and then I remember straightening her out like she was a little teddy bear, like she wasn't a person, a doll. And my son, I went to the chair, the rocker, and held him. <laughs> my hand over his eyes. believes it is the shame and guilt of Catherine that still lives within her today. At the suggestion of sightings, Taylor agreed to consult with Dr. Brian Weiss, a psychiatrist who has studied past life regression extensively. Let your breathing take you deeper. You're already very, very peaceful and relaxed. You'll be able to go deeper than you have before. In this state, the memory is very enhanced. You can remember everything. This is for your experience. This is to help you. 
That's the most important part. After two days of intensive therapy with Dr. Weiss, Taylor began to relive even more of the life and death of Catherine. We are going. They are on the train. What is it like on this train? The others are singing and praying. Mm -hmm. And it's dark. And it's crowded and there's children. Do you know where this train is going? Where is it going? Buchenwald. To Buchenwald? Buchenwald, yes. This is all important to remember and then to let it go. You can go in. You know you're safe now. During the sessions, Taylor had vivid memories of life in the Buchenwald camp. She had visions of medical experiments being performed against her will, experiments which ultimately killed her. Go to the end of that life, that last day of her life, and let's see what happens. Can you see your body? What does, what does it look like? It is very thin. Mm -hmm. The breast is missing. Mm -hmm. I think the arm is missing. An arm? <laughs> and there's sewing in the stomach, and mm -hmm. it's just thin. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's leave this all together now. During another session with Dr. Weiss, Taylor had recalled the last name Leibowitz, possibly a family name. As part of the healing process, Taylor visited the Miami Holocaust Memorial. The images there were hauntingly familiar. And there, on the wall of remembrance, was the name she knew too well. Although agonizing, Taylor's journey through Catherine's life has been a way to heal. Taylor's story seems similar to many of the cases I've had from the Holocaust in terms of the memories and the details and the emotion. But the remembrance still seems to be very healing, whether they're validated or not validated. People seem to get better, to lose their fears and phobias, to have more joy and happiness in their current lives. This is the important thing to me. If I let that healing continue, maybe for the first time, I get to really live. With the new clues she has uncovered in her most recent therapy session, Taylor hopes to locate any living relatives of Catherine and put the past to rest. Next, will new theories on controlling time and space lead us to alien worlds? Perhaps an outer space extraterrestrials may have the capability to open a hole in space. H.G. Wells had the time machine. Sherman and Mr. Peabody had the Wayback Machine, and Michael J. Fox had a DeLorean. The fantasy of time travel is one of the most popular themes in science fiction. And now a tantalizing new theory suggests that time travel could someday be science fact. When time travel becomes possible, it will not be the kind of vehicle that's important, but rather the discovery of an interdimensional shortcut. In these scenes from Star Trek, the shortcut is a cosmic anomaly called a wormhole. We might have just discovered the first stable wormhole known to exist. Bring us about, Lieutenant. In science fiction, time travel is possible because cosmic anomalies not only warp space, they also warp time. But does science support the existence of these interstellar superhighways? The average scientist says that the distances between stars are so great, four light years to the nearest star, that Star travel is simply impractical. It would take them hundreds of years to go between nearby star systems. Therefore, they are skeptical that we have been visited by aliens from outer space. Michio Kaku is a professor of theoretical physics at the City University of New York. In his book, Hyperspace, Kaku suggests that there is a mechanism capable of warping time. And Kaku does not rule out the possibility that another, more advanced civilization may have already found that mechanism the unified field that Einstein dreamt about. The new wrinkle, which has caused quite a bit of excitement among theoretical physicists, is that perhaps this river of time 
can have eddy currents, whirlpools, and perhaps may even fork at a crucial juncture in history. But where those forks and eddies are, no one knows. The cosmic highway isn't marked with signs saying, wormhole next right, or this way to ancient Egypt. At this point, just finding holes in space is more of a stumbling block than traveling through them. Perhaps the outer space extraterrestrials may have the capability with the technology thousands of years beyond our own to open a hole in space and to begin to manipulate the fabric of space and time. And that is precisely how Mark Davenport explains his belief that many UFO sightings are, in fact, extraterrestrial spacecraft. In Visitors from Time, Davenport describes hundreds of reported UFO sightings and alien abduction cases that he believes support his time travel theories. So my hypothesis is that these people who operate these ships their technology is so advanced that they've actually figured out a way to artificially warp space-time the way a black hole does naturally. And if that's true, it could mean they could be coming here not only from other planets, but from other star systems, other galaxies, other dimensions that coexist with ours, parallel universes, even our own future or our own past. By collating and cross-referencing specifics from eyewitnesses, Davenport believes he has compelling evidence that many UFOs are actually time machines. We have the uh, occupants of these craft are continually telling people, they ask them questions like, what time is it? What is time? What is your time? What is age? What is a year? And they say, you, you are caught in time and we're not. Our time is different from yours. Time is distorted. In the, in the vicinity of these craft and inside these craft. A lot of times, people's watches will stop. We have people who say that their voices are distorted when they're near this craft, like when they breathe helium or something. So we, we have all sorts of indication that these things are in some kind of a field that warps space and time. And one day, according to Michio Kaku, science will catch up with science fiction and we will create a time machine of our own. Most of my friends watch science fiction because they want to dream about what may be possible in the future. Real scientists at the cutting edge, working on the unified field theory, working on higher dimensions, working on time travel, these are the ones who are playful. These are the ones who let their imagination soar into hyperspace. Not all scientists agree with Michio Kaku's hyperspace theory. Eminent physicist Stephen Hawking has stated that time travel is impossible because we've never been visited by any tourists from the future. Or have we? Next, a sightings update. A psychic detective finds clues to a murder in this man's dreams. It really wasn't considered a dream to me anymore because it all seemed so real, like I knew them or something. On a previous sightings, we profiled Charles Byerly, a man who has been plagued by recurring dreams of a brutal double murder. He said that he didn't know the victims or the killer, and dream experts found this highly unusual. In most recurring dream cases, the dreamer has a link to people in the dream. Sightings contacted psychic Kathleen Ray to see if she could find a hidden link between Charles and his dreams. It got worse as it went along. Everything became like a nightmare. It really wasn't considered a dream to me anymore because it all seemed so real, like I knew them or something. For more than three years, Charles Byerly has been dreaming about the real-life murders of 15-year-old Barbara Grimes and her 13-year-old sister, Patricia. The girls were last seen alive in December of 1956, leaving their Chicago home on the way to the movies. Their bodies were found a month later along a rural road. I believe they've been reaching out. They still are. Maybe they're not at rest, you know? Maybe they just want to find out who did it, who's responsible. Chicago police detective Jerry Schultz is keeping track of Byerly's dreams and feels there may be something significant in the strange recurring visions. Detective Schultz agreed to consult with psychic detective Kathleen Ray about the still unsolved case. The first thing I do is take the victims and do a psychological profile. In the case of these two girls, I went into their personalities to see why would they perhaps go with a stranger and get it themselves into this situation. Then the other thing I do is look to see the suspect. Do they know the suspect? 
I feel the man is probably in his early 30s. Um, he gives off the feeling of late 20s, early 30s, somewhere in there. I feel that he came upon the girls while they were waiting for a bus. I feel that they crossed over from the theater to a bus stop, and then I feel they had to go to another one, and that's where this happened. These psychic visions mirror Charles's dreams in every detail but one. Kathleen Ray sees only one murderer. I can smell alcohol on him, not only from that night, but like it comes out of his pores, like he drinks a lot. I can smell cigarette smoke on him. I could see his hands, and I could tell he was a laborer of some type, a manual laborer, because they were all um, rough from working with his hands. This man could very easily have worked for Santa Fe Railroad or for a company of that nature. we we'll start with an S. Working together over the phone, Kathleen Ray received confirmation for many of her psychic visions. Encouraged, Kathleen flew to Chicago to meet with Detective Schultz. She led the detective to the site of a demolished shack where, she believes, the killer once lived and where he killed the Grimes sisters. I felt it was a green shack. It was back among trees. It was like I could see forest around it. I felt water behind it. And uh, I felt that there were no lights of houses near, so I knew it was isolated so the little girls wouldn't be heard. And it certainly has everything I saw in my mind that fits the scene. When I first uh, started working with the psychic, I was very skeptical, okay? Uh, through my belief and upbringing, whether it be from a, a religious end, uh, I just not I did not believe in psychics. However, after spending several hours talking to Kathleen Ray, I've changed my opinion drastically. Uh, Kathleen Ray has said things to me about this area and about the terrain out here, which only someone who knows this area quite well would, would know about. And no one had told Kathleen Ray that the site of the shack was only three miles from where the bodies were actually found. I feel like he stopped and he brought them down, drug them down far enough to where people wouldn't be inclined to, to be driving along and see them just on the edge of the road. Although Kathleen Ray believes the murderer no longer lives in the area, she is confident he will be found. I feel like he's still alive. I feel like he doesn't live here right now. I feel like he lives in a state that has more mountainous terrain around. Uh, I felt it was a state that started with an M. With the clues that Kathleen Ray has given me, I've got somebody in mind, okay? Uh, it's just something that I'm looking at right now. The recurring dreams that plague Charles Byerly and the psychic visions of Kathleen Ray each point in the same direction. It's a direction that Detective Schultz is now following in the hope that Barbara and Patricia Grimes may finally rest in peace. Officially, there is no suspect in the death of the Grimes sisters. But Detective Schultz is following up on the leads Kathleen Ray has provided in a concerted effort to reopen the case. Sightings has expanded its America Online area. Keyword sightings when you log on for access to sighting stories, images, and events. To subscribe to America Online, call 1-800-591-3344. And you can still reach sightings 24 hours a day at 1-900-933-7444. Until next time, remember, no mystery is closed to an open mind. For sightings, I'm Tim White. On sci fi, dark shadows. What planet is this? Explore the origins of the Federation with 10 uncut episodes from the final frontier. We're from your future. And exclusive commentary the Star Trek 35th anniversary chain reaction. Saturday, all day on sci fi.